Life is a road straight and narrow. Stay on the road, and it will take you safely home, but make a wrong turn. And you will meet the darkness. somewhere I don't think so come on stay and play look I have a marriage to protect you're afraid I'm gonna expose you to your wife yeah. it wasn't a robbery can you think of anyone who might want to harm you friends family or a woman you screwed and discarded this wasn't part of the plan did you do it did i do what Believe you. I made one wrong turn. And it cost me everything. Well, then you shouldn't have come to Vegas. Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. Today at Africa Roundtables, we have as a special guest, Roxanne Abbott Taylor, a co partner in Hidden Empire Films Entertainment, and also one of the producers of the new film, Fatal. Let me introduce you to the Africa members who are taking place today on the call, starting with Mercedes Springer in Atlanta, Carolyn Hines in Toronto, Jill Monroe. Jill, where are you? L.A., Gil, L.A. I keep forgetting, I'm sorry. Rhonda <laughs> Rasha Penrise in Atlanta, Sharonda Williams in Atlanta, and Okima Gunn in Chicago. I'm gonna let you ladies do what you do so well. I will see you on the other side. Thank you, Gil. Hi, Roxanne, Mercedes Hi. here out of Atlanta with She Critiques. Um, Okay, so because of the times that we're in right now, we can't avoid this, right? I've rewatched the film, but I'm looking at it through a different lens now. Um, and I see more clearly now than ever that Hilary Swank's character is kind of operating with some privilege here, okay? Now, was the character written for her to have mental health issues in that capacity? Or in your opinion, is she operating from the privilege of being a white woman with a badge to kill so many people? Um, you know, listen, I, I think, you know, yes, obviously the elephant in the room of what's going on in the world is, is, you know, something that, I mean, I can't address, you know what I mean? It's just crazy to even be able to witness something so detrimental to our country. But I mean, as far as Hillary goes, I mean, she became that way because of what happened to her. She's not mentally ill in a sense. She is a broken soul because of what has happened in her life due to, in my mind, self-inflicted decisions that she has made along the way. You know, so she's struggling with her demons on her decisions on things that have happened and she's trying to fight and get that back. Now, you know, as far as going on, you know, the way she's done it, I mean, I'm a mother. I'm not saying I would do everything the same way she did it, but you know, you're capable of doing anything. You know what I mean? When you are fighting 
for something so important to you as her as her daughter and her life back that you're willing to I feel like do anything you know if that answers your question <laughs> I understand thank you so much mm -hmm. and Kathy Woods Capusco, out of Philadelphia um my question to you is um there is a lot of like side relationship things going on and 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 Michael Ely's character is a little bit in denial about his partnership, his wife's relationship. And can you talk a little bit about why you all chose to go in that direction where he didn't quite understand that those things also contributed to the mess that he's in? I mean, you know, Michael Ely's also a broken character. You know what I mean? Everybody in this film is is broken. And, you know, he's, you know, obviously doesn't realize that he's in a relationship that's past the point of no return. You know, I mean, he doesn't find this out until later. And and these two broken souls that are completely empty meet in Vegas. You know what I mean? And and they they figure out that they're getting something from each other, you know what I mean? Not knowing how this is gonna play out later. You know, she she doesn't go into this as, as targeting him, but she finds a way that she can use him. He used her in Vegas. And so she wants to use him back, you know? And, and, and it plays right in her hands on what she wants to be able to, you know, fight for her daughter. Absolutely, thank you so much. Sure. Jill Monroe, jacksonstilettojill.com. Hi, Roxanne, how are Hi. you? Good, I love your background going on. I gotta get my background together back here. Thank Shermanda you. Sharonda got her background good. I need to learn how to do that. I keep saying that, I need to learn how to do that. Just fluff it up a little bit. So one of the things um, about the character's relationship with Derek and Rafe is that they started this business together and now they're on the cusp of being able to sell it and make so much more money as well as changing their business. So for you as a producer who started out in the independent ranks and has since had films that are now being um, presented on a mass scale, how did you relate to that in the film? And how does that relate to you as far as business and how you operate now? Hmm, that's a good question. You know, I ain't set up for this kind of stuff. No. <laughs> anyway, um, I mean, listen, we're still independent. We've I've been an independent filmmaker my whole entire career. You know what I mean? I'm making um, movies on a very small price point. Fatal was made under $7 million. You know, the studio did not give us this money. We raised this money. We went out to Dante. We went out to the talent and begged, you know what I mean? And tried to get them to believe in our vision and, and, and believe in the story to want to come on and make this movie with us. Um, it's really hard and you gotta, you gotta, when you're making movies for people and audience, you gotta make sure that it's, well, we'd like to make sure that we're humanizing these characters so everybody can relate to them. Um, I feel like for me, your name, which is the backdrop of this movie, all you have is your name and your reputation, especially for black and brown people is what we're constantly fighting for. And so for me, it's about leaving a legacy for my family and for my kids and, you know, we, we're we not gonna sell or do anything. Like, yes, we went and did Black and Blue with Sony, for example, as a work for hire, because we believed in that social comp, that social messaging that it, it portrayed in society as it was right then. But, you know, we're, you gotta make a decision on where you wanna be. Do you wanna be work for hire or do you want to own your own IPs? And we went into this with, we'll fight even harder, we'll sacrifice even more so we can leave that legacy, so we can have something for our kids and show like, hey, you can do this. We're self-taught. We didn't, we didn't have no schooling. We didn't have that mentorship. We didn't have that upbringing. We're first generation business owners. So we didn't have anybody that could guide us. Like, this is how you do this. This is how you do that. We just came to the realization that we want to create a library 
necessary that will stand the test of time, you know, that we can, you know, compare to the next maybe Blumhouse or A24, you know, we can, we can compete on a studio level. And I think we've proven that. Um, as far as the film, I think, you know, you get going and you get hot, everybody starts from nothing, right? Everybody's, I mean, we're all somebody, but you know, as far as your career, you start at the bottom to get to the top. And a lot of times I feel like people lose who they are in that process and what they want. And you can easily be influenced by those, those gold coins or, you know, that check or whatever that is to sway you in a different direction. And I think Coulter was that. You don't know that you're going to make a lot more money. You know what I mean? It's it's not it's not that you're going to make a lot more money. It's the facade of that big WME is coming to you to give you this and give you that. Do you go? You know what I mean? No, you you stand your ground. You continue to make content that you want to make and do deals that you want to make on your terms, right? Without having to answer to anybody. And that's the best way I feel like to live and create business and leave a legacy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Raza and Carolyn from Toronto Press. Here's what happened podcast. Um, so my question kind of leads a little bit off of what Jill um, asked you, and it has to do with the production and working as a company now in in a in an industry where everything has changed because of the pandemic. So can you say can you talk a little bit about the challenges that you faced in 2020? going on into 2021 and how that has helped you, you and your company to grow over the short space of time that you've had to adjust to something so monumental. So 2020 was, was really hard for all of us, but you have to be able to like, just make the adjustments and figure it out. You know, it was, it was so exciting to be able to have a movie slated in the summer of 2020 like a summer blockbuster and then COVID happens and you're like, oh my God, you finally get the opportunity to have this positioning and then it doesn't happen, you know? And then we're like, okay, we're going to switch it to October. This will all be over by now. You know what I mean? No. So here we go, October. And we're like, okay, we were initially thinking, oh, we'll put it out February, 2021 during Valentine's Day, because we always try to theme it towards an event to inventize it, right? And so I'm like, oh my God, what do we do? So Lionsgate came to us and said, hey, listen, 2021 is super saturated, as you guys all probably know. Everybody has moved to 2021. You got blockbuster after blockbuster every single weekend, which means the screens are gonna be competition. The media is gonna have competition. Placement's gonna have competition. All of the journalists and critics, like it's just, you can't live. You know what I mean? You can't live in that, in that space. And so I said, listen, it's a new way of doing things. Let's, let's take the risk, you know? The window has changed, you know, from, the theatrical to the VOD, which is now P PVOD, right? Premium video on demand. The window's now 21 days. It might be shortened again. So literally your theatrical is from December 18th in our case, right? All the way through February 23rd, right? So not only will you live in the theaters, you will be in everybody's home with the click of a button for rental. You can't buy it yet still until March. So that's a movie ticket, right? So we literally was like, okay, it's the holidays. There's no content, right? There's nothing coming out. Everything's been watched. Let's just take a leap of faith and try this out, right? What do we have to lose? I mean, that's our story of our life is jumping out on a limb, right? And being independent, we were able to make that decision you know, and, and Lionsgate was smart enough to see this window. I give them major props, but they couldn't do it without our approval. And so we really like internally had to have this discussion and say, hey, what does everybody think? And we made the decision, I think it was the best decision we ever made. You know what I mean? As far as releasing this film, 
The excitement for Pivot on Friday is bananas. We're holding in the theaters that are open and continuously to increase from weekend to weekend. So I feel like, you know, obviously the film that you make for the audience right now, the time is everybody needs some escapism. So this movie gives you that escape, you know, to take you away for an hour and 45 minutes, all the craziness that's going on in the world. So I think it was, it was a no brainer, although it was scary. Now, we also shot a movie in the pandemic called Don't Fear in June. So the decision to do that, again, you can't fear, right? You, have, you can't live in fear because then where will we be, right? So again, we took a leap of faith. We're like, okay, this is the new normal. If it's COVID testing, if it's quarantining, what is it? What is the new way of applying to the guilds to get approved to shoot a movie? So for me, it's always a learning experience because I'm always a student, right? As a producer to be better and better and better and have more knowledge to be able to continue to create and compete at the highest level. So I said, you know, we're gonna go shoot this movie. You know, it's minimal crew, minimal cast in, a, in an area that had no deaths, minimal cases. And now I know what to do. Now I feel like I'm a COVID specialist. I know the labs, I know the processing, I know the process. So now I can go shoot a movie in the pandemic, right? If needed, I can speak to that. I can talk to it as well as releasing a movie in the pandemic and what it takes and what it looks like. So for me, yes, it's a challenge because you have to figure things out. But as a producer, that's your job is to produce. There is no no, there is no, oh, let me see, let me check. That doesn't exist when you're working for a filmmaker and a studio as well. Like you need to figure it out. And so it's the biggest challenge that we had to have in 2020, but I feel like we figured it out. We did a good job and, and moving into 2021, now I know exactly we got two more movies that are gonna be releasing in 2021. So now I know, okay, this is how this needs to be done. This is the window. It gives me more negotiating power because I've already done it. I know how it works, right? And so that's just kind of how I look at look at filmmaking as a producer in, 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 a, in a whole. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, hi, Roxanne. It's, it's hi. finally good to meet you. Yes, good to meet you too. Um, hi. Yeah, so I'm Okima Seven Gun, and I'm with Seven Gun Media. And my question is, um, so your last, um, your last couple of films, so um, Black and Blue came out and then you had Traffic and those were um, very gritty films. And, and so I noticed that um, Fatal was also very gritty. And so because you have that kind of experience with um, those kind of thrillers, um, I wanted to know how was Fatal a little bit different from that, and I know you you know you talked about the whole um, um, post production with you know with the COVID and those things, but I want I wanted to actually know on set what did you learn with um, from your cast and crew that was a little bit different from your other films. I mean, Fatal, you know, we shot Fatal in LA. It was the biggest budget movie that we've been able to shoot independently outside mm -hmm. of the studio. Um, so I did have a little bit more money, but you know, $6 million ain't much to shoot a movie. But I mean, I think obviously with Fatal, the talent, it was a much elevated, more elevated film. You know, being able to work with two-time Academy Award winner, Hilary Swank was, incredible you know what i mean i learned so much from her and the process of how she gets to where she needs to be in her moments with her character was amazing you know what i mean just her work ethic michael too like i've been a fan of michael for for many many years household name but when i watched him in this movie it's the best performance i've ever seen him in you know what I mean? Because I feel like his range has been limited in the movies that he's made. And I feel like he was able to showcase his talent for the first time in his career with this film. 
And then to be able to go toe to toe with Hillary Swank is priceless. You know what I mean? Dante, I mean, this guy, he's, I mean, he was making movies before I was even thought of. You know, he's been a cinematographer for 50 years. To be on the set with someone of that caliber, I mean, everybody, I'm just surrounded by greatness, you know? And, and to be able to be on that set and learn from them, those people is like, it's, it's priceless. Like I said, you, you don't get those moments very often. And I, I just tried to live in the moment a little bit more. Um, being independent, you're, you, you get so much flexibility on set to make changes with the writing, with the scenes, with the lighting. And I think Dante, he elevated this movie I've never seen a movie so beautiful. Dion says it so well. He says, you know what? Turn off the sound of this movie and just watch it. It's so beautifully done, right? That I think it's his best film ever, Dante's. You know, from Heat and Last of the Mohicans, just visually, it's incredible. And, you know, Again, like to be on the set with these guys, Peter Rosenthal, like highest of the highest level of crew, you know, to learn from them, I think was the biggest experience for me with Fatal. You know, Jeff Zanelli, the composer who's done Maleficent and Pirates of the Caribbean, being able to work with these guys to teach me, you know, how to be better at what I do. Um, it, it was it was incredible. I mean, you know, Mike Coulter, Tyron Turner, he's a legend. You know what I mean? Giving him the opportunity to be in a movie, share the screen with Hillary Swank, like the feeling of being able to create jobs for black and brown people in front of the camera, behind the camera is, is a big thing for me too. And Fatal, I, we were just able to do and, and showcase like the highest level of talent that we've never been able to do so far. I would agree with you on that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Roxanne, how are you? Hi, Sharonda, how's it going? You know, I'm just here surviving, just, just trying to stay safe. my day, yeah, yes. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I really enjoy about your movies is, you really do such a fantastic job of showing um, Black people in a different way. I think your movies really dispel the stereotypes of Black people, um, where we get to see them live in, er in elegance, in high society with great jobs. And we especially see this in Fatal with the characters. And so I wanted to ask you the importance of, through your films, of really helping tear down these stereotypes of the life, a day in the life of Black people. Yeah, I mean, listen, we, we're successful too, you know what I mean? It's, it's like, it, I, we're tired of seeing the same cookie cutter, you know, slave mentality of what black and brown people come from, right? Like it's, it's a new day, we need to be showcased for the strong people that we are and what we do. So our youth can see on the screen, like I said, and behind the camera that you can do this. Like, and it takes people like all of us on this call to pave the way to make those opportunities for the people behind us. Like I never had those opportunities. And so if you don't showcase them and if you don't show them and you don't allow people to have those opportunities, then they, they don't know that they can be attainable, right? If you live in this box, you know, like I tell my daughter all the time, she's 16, my oldest, and you know, she follows the same group of people and hangs out with the same this. The radius is, you know, two miles north, south, east, east and west. You got to go outside of your shell. You got to show what else is out there. This world is massive. You know what I mean? And it's not just this one group and one way of thinking. And we need to showcase hey, listen, Black people are just as successful as white people, right? Although we have been trying to break down those barriers along the way, we're getting there. We, we have to show and give people opportunity because 
if you don't give it to them, who's going to give it to them, right? Who's going to, no one's going to give, we got a huge problem in Hollywood and in corporate society of black and brown people being executives in the company, right? It, it's, it's rare that you see a black woman running a company, right? Or running a department because not only do we suffer from the racism, we suffer from the sexism. It's a white man's world. And with me growing up through this business, I started as a PA, you know what I mean? Picking up garbage. And I went through every single step to get to the producer level that I'm at right now. And, and, and no matter what I've done, there is still no like validation. There is no highlights, right, of what I've done. And, and a lot of people in the same position has done a fraction of what I've done but they get all the accolades, all the praises, all the jobs, all the this, right? And I'm not doing it for that, but because of that, right? It's up to me and other black women to create opportunities for other black women that come behind me so we can stand together and be able to be in the room, have the seats at the table that everybody else does, you know? I mean, I look at like, I'm just like trying to figure out like every movie. I mean, my, my, if you come on my set, it's like our, uh, we have all types of people on our set. Do you know what I mean? All colors, all races, all sex. And it's, it's, um, it's a little overwhelming, I think for some people, but the truth of the matter is, is, is it should be colorless. It's not about what you look like. It's not about what color you are. It's about your performance, whether your talent or your camera or your wardrobe or whatever it is you do, it's your work. It's how you perform. And that's how everybody should be looked at, you know, is how they perform, how their work ethic is, um, you know, what opportunities that they're creating, their creativity. Unfortunately, we've lived in a world for so long that that's how it is and that's the light that's been shined. But, it takes all of us to break that mold, right? And we're getting there because our next generation, we got his and her in, in our signatures now. There is, it's they, it's he, she, you know what I mean? There is no label, even in Congress, they've changed it, right? It should be no label. And I think this next generation is really gonna be able to important for me as a black woman and a company owner to make sure that I do my part, right? Which is showcasing successful black people, showcasing successful black talent and creating those opportunities and hoping that they will then pay it forward. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi, Roxanne. Hi. I'm so happy to see you out here. I've, I've long wanted to hear more from you. So thank you for stepping out of the shadows. But I oh, wanted to- Thank you, I'm always hiding, girl. I'm always hiding. I know, I know. <laughs> I was just so excited to hear for this film that you were doing this. Um, so thank you again. But I wanted to ask, how did you guys convince Hillary Swank to um, take a chance and work with you guys? You know, just like we did with Dante, I mean, we we went through the traditional way, you know, trying to go through the agent and the managers and we were shut down immediately, you know what I mean? Um, because they're like, do you know who she is kind of attitude? Like, do you know who she is? And you do know she has two Oscars, right? Like, go, go, go over there, you know what I mean? So just like we did with Dante, we figured out a nifty way to get to her and wrote her a letter and reached out to her directly and, and asked, could she read the script? And would she meet with us? You know what I mean? And she did, you know, without all the bells and whistles in between, you know, long story short, she did. And we met with her, we showed her intruder, like our work so she could see kind of the work and, and what we do. And, Dion is very convincing. He can sell ice 
to a penguin. Do you know what I mean? So he, he did his dancing and his pitching and he wooed her and she committed, you know what I mean? And, and that's the biggest thing, like, again, with independent filmmaking is you have the flexibility to kind of do whatever you want to do, right? You don't have to answer to anybody. And even though they told us no, we're like, no, we're going to go to her because we knew that he, they didn't even give it to her. We knew that they didn't even present it to her. You know, how do you represent somebody and just pass for them without, like, I just never understood that. Because if I, if it's me, you better bring every single thing to me with a quick little line, like, oh, this came in, this to off or whatever, just so I can make the decision. But, you know, as we know, they make the decision for them. And so because of that, that made us even more hungry to try to figure out how to get to her. We got to her and she loved the script. And because it was early enough in the process, she was able to help build the script with us and build the character to where it made her comfortable, right? With what she was walking into because she didn't know who we were. She didn't even know who Michael Ely was. We had to show her, a, I'm like, you don't know who Michael Ely is? He has a bigger box office than you do, technically. Like, what the? He is a household name. We sent the picture to her. She was like, oh, wow, he's handsome. I said, girl, yeah, he got the green eyes. He got all the stuff. Like, what? How do you not know him? Anyway, it was, it was a lot of convincing, but she is a very real person and she's super humble. And she came from a similar background as us, you know what I mean? Being raised by her mother in a trailer, living out of her car and having to work 10 times harder to get those positions and those jobs. And so it, that script, I think, hit home for her and is coming from a real place, which made her, you know, really pay attention um, to the content and want to help build it with us. Congrats. I'm Rebecca Ford. I'm in Chicago. I'm with the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin and WCPT Progressive Hi. Talk Radio. Hi. Hi. Listen, so I wanted to ask you to elaborate on your um, dream to build a studio. I mean, so I guess when you were talking to Jill, you were saying, like, look at what Bloomhouse is doing. And so I wanted you to talk to us some more about um that idea and then also like hey how'd you raise that seven million dollars <laughs> well listen we didn't we didn't know we were gonna try do this whole studio thing it all was just by default you know i mean i was um you know before this i was a computer science major i was installing hardware and software i didn't i always wanted to be in the movie business had a love of film you know but super camera shy, don't want to be in the limelight and that whole thing. And so I said, oh, maybe I'll try go behind the scenes to figure it out and, and do it that way. I didn't even know. Listen, I didn't know nothing about nothing <laughs> about film other than I loved movies, you know, and Dion was playing professional basketball and I've known him, you know, 30 years, never knew I'd be working with him you know, we'd be partnered. None of that was like planned. It just all was by default. And he decided to write his first movie, which became our first movie called 75. And because he, I was the only one he thought he knew in the business because I didn't know nothing. You know what I mean? He was like, oh, let's go make a movie. And at that time, I was, I had finally got to where I was working at the Director's Guild. Again, didn't even know what the Director's Guild was. Super cutthroat, super male chauvinist. I was working, you know, 17 hours a day being physically abused. And I was like, hold on, this is not for me. And I quit. I was like, I am not gonna be treated like this. I am not gonna be talked to like this. You know what I mean? Because I, it was new, it was new territory for me. And so I was like, yeah, let's go make the movie. You know, I'm young, I'm like, you, this is the time when you just do whatever, you know, and don't think about it. And so we did it and we both fell in love with it, you know? And fortunately we were so blessed 
although that first movie we were able to utilize his friends um, that were in the in the sports industry. So football, his brother played football. He was blessed to play basketball. So we used that little network to raise, you know, 50, 100, you know, to make this $1 million movie, you know? And so from that moment on, we were actually blessed because we were able to meet Robert Smith, who is our financial partner in every film that we do because he took a chance on us. Um, and that's simply what he did because we were nobody. You know what I mean? We didn't know what we were doing, where we were going. We had no plan essentially. And he he took a chance on us and gave us some finishing dollars on that first movie that we made. And we were able to create the distribution, make the money back. And so he just continued to, you know, keep re-upping those dollars. And so we just, you, you, you ride off those successes, I say, like in, in the movie business, right? You, you raise the money on set. You, you get people's interest on set because they see you in action actually doing something, actually making the movie. It's not just a concept, you're doing it. And the excitement for that for investors makes it a little bit easier to raise money because you're actually doing it. You know what I mean? And so we've been able to leverage film to film to do that. Um, the studio part of it all, you know, we just, we have been told no our whole entire career. You know, we, from the scripts to the distribution, we had to find our way through Hollywood because they would not let us in no matter what we did. I mean, and we, all we tried to do was check every box to figure it out, like, okay, we got this now, this box is checked. Okay, let's try to get this box to get in. And we're continuously told no. So by default is how we came into creating our own hidden empire studio because we were forced to go do it on our own. And then because we were forced to do it on our own, when we went to go make a studio movie, we like, wait a minute this is not the move. You know what I mean? You got to answer to 20 people in the office, 20 people on set. There is no flexibility, you know, with the script and the creative. And I said, we got it right. You know what I mean? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for putting us through this position and through this rabbit hole to be able to learn how to do this on our own. Because now, we don't have to go ask what movie we wanna make. We don't have to go ask, can you please give us some money to make our movie? We just go pick and choose what we wanna do. And then we take our movie to them and say, this is what we got and this is what we want. You know what I mean? And there's no better feeling than that. Well, thank you. That was, that was really inspiring. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. Uh, What's up, Gil? You so cool, man. How you doing? I haven't seen you and talked to you in so long. I'm good. I'm good. Just trying to stay uh, COVID free. <laughs> man, I know. Because you're in LA too, right? I'm actually in Atlanta right now. Oh, you're in Atlanta. But okay. yeah, I was trying to hitch a ride with you guys home when you guys were down here. I told <laughs> Dion, I said, well, maybe I can go back home uh, on your private plane because I'm afraid to fly commercial. Not my yet. That was cut. Thank you to Lionsgate, but hopefully soon I can say my private plane. <laughs> exactly, but the rates are whole. It's so hot out there. I'm like waiting for the curve to flatten no, at this it's point. Crazy, it's crazy. Well, thank you so much for absolutely. having me. Absolutely, absolutely. We were yeah, as soon as you're like, oh, absolutely. I mean, you, like I was telling your husband. I mean, um, I think all of us on here are very clear that uh, beside, not behind, every great man is an equally great sister. And oh, so thank you. we definitely are, are happy to be able to do whatever we can to support and elevate and, and just, you know, be a, a partner. No, I appreciate, I appreciate all the ladies. Cause again, like literally I usually be like, no, I'm cool. I got a meeting. Cause I'm just, you know, I'm just not that good at this stuff. And I'm like, 
Well, Dion, you handled it. You handled Dion it like a, <laughs> you handled it like a pro. <laughs> Thank you. No, I, I, it's, it's glad it's to see all the the black women on here that's in the business that's behind all of this. Like, we need more of it. You know what I mean? Because it's so hard to get a real person that comes from a real place to talk about your movie, you know what I mean? That can understand the characters, understand the stories. Our whole entire career, except for this movie, we're getting critics and people that are, you know, 75 year old white men. And that's great, but he don't have no idea who Michael <laughs> Ely or any of these people are. Like we need more people like-minded like us to watch our movies and support our movies and then follow through and talk about the movie, right? Um, and say, hey, this is what it is. Because if, if we don't do it for each other, then that 75 year old white man writes up this critic and it's terrible because he has no knowledge of black people in a whole. And then what happens, you know? You sound like John Singleton. That was something he used to always <laughs> say about, you know, I guess if we bring any value, we bring that, the fact of our understanding of, of these stories because these stories are a reflection of our identities, you know, yes. and our relationships. Yes, so, absolutely. yeah, I, um, yeah, I'm, 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 and we need an entity like, uh, you know, Hidden Empire because, uh, you know, there's just so few out there that are doing, uh, that are uh, are focusing on our stories. Yes. And, yes. and that are owned by us. And I mean, it's just, it's a wonderful, wonderful, uh, uh, it's, that's what I'm all about, so. No, I appreciate it, man. It's, it's, it's exciting to be able, like I was saying earlier to one of the ladies, like, to be able to cast black people, beautiful black people in films that we can all look on the screen and identify with that come from a real place. Like I never even thought I would be living this life. You know what I mean? To be able to make those kind of decisions. And then now having studio execs look to me for my opinion. You know, to be able to place these people in these these positions is like a dream come true. You know, One and just think of all the all the careers you're uh, you're going to be responsible for behind the camera. I mean, those meat and potato careers that you know that uh, people you know that's how they raise their families. You know, the grips and the the uh, sound mixer and I mean, the, you know, all those people that are getting that training ground. You know, yeah. getting that first shot opportunity you know, through your productions is, is, is priceless, really. No, I appreciate that. I mean, that's one of our goals through our philanthropic arm is to make sure that we mentor, you know, our youth. We bring people to the set every single movie to actually have conversations with every department head, including the cast, like how they got there, how they started. You know, you, you, you don't start at the top. You know, people, they look at this like, oh, I'm gonna be this and I'm gonna be that. You gotta put in the work and you gotta know what work to put in and that it can be attainable. You know what I mean? But you gotta get those opportunities. I mean, there's people that we've brought on not only to the company, but behind the camera that have their own business now that are in the union now that are thriving you know what i mean and i'm happy that i'm able to even call them my friend you know what i mean like they i mean our costume designer solomon fob worked on black panther he was a pa do you know what i mean like our barber you know one of our um hair person karen dick i mean she's producing now like it's like you have to empower your own people and give them an opportunity. I never had those opportunities. Nobody empowered me. No one's like, come on girl, because unfortunately black, some black people, they're always in competition with one another. You know what I mean? And they, you can share the same space. White people do it all the time. You know what I mean? And, and they, quite frankly, they can hate you. But if they gonna make some money and they gonna have a deal going, they listen, they a high five all day long to get it done. You know what I mean? See, I see we're gonna have to have drinks once we get past COVID. <laughs> 
I'm all for drinks, okay? I'm all you for know. drinks. Roxanne, thank you for your time uh, today on Africa's Roundtable. On behalf of the world's largest group of Black film critics, thank you for watching and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Happy 2021. Come on. Yes, yes. Let's go. Don't be scared. Don't fear. Let's go. That's right. That's right. Thanks a lot. Right, Thanks, everyone. All right, you too. Bye.